All right, what's going on everybody? My name is Dr. Harry Malinsky, also known as CryptoVet, and I'm here with a guest who needs no introduction whatsoever. You guys saw us at the Davos house, you've seen us at Art Bomb, we're back at the Austin Convention Center, and I'm here with Jet Prescott, the Rolling Stone Cultural Council. I'll let you take it away, my Hey, man. thank you, my dude. Always yeah. a pleasure, Harry. Thank you so much for pulling all of us together here. Absolutely thrilled to be here with Charles Haskinson, the one and only, who is here in support of all of his efforts around the world banking the unbanked, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are at Consensus. I mean, how, how are you feeling about it? How are you enjoying your, your time here, the vibe? It's been a pretty wild time. I mean, it's the most diverse event I think I've ever gotten to. We had a community event and 1,200 people showed up. Some people flew in from Singapore, Australia. I can't imagine being coached with a mask on for Ooh. 16 hours. That's, that's hardcore. But they came and uh, they stood in 100 degree weather just to see us speak and to interact. And then uh, the main event has about 17,000 people from across the industry. And there's been a lot of great VIP parties. Uh, we put on one and Elijah Wood showed up to DJ. Okay. And I was like, what? okay, we got, DJ? we got Frodo go. DJing. This is, this is crazy. And then Ice Cube showed up and did a few sets. And it's uh, just this uh, getting in a photo with Elijah Wood and Ice Cube. Is, in the same, so cool. how did the room not implode? I know, <laughs> right? All right. It's, like, it's just, this is like, this is a simulation or something yeah, like yeah. that. Uh, so it's just incredible to see the energy and the passion, the enthusiasm, because everybody's around is actually building stuff. They're talking right. about stuff. It's not just, hey, there's tokens. It's, hey, how do we transform the music business? How do we transform yep. banking? How do we transform supply chain and all these other things? And it's cool because the, the conversations are deep and meaningful. Five, 10 years ago, the conversations were aspirational. And now there is specifically solutions based where right. well, that's all fine and dandy. How do you build it? How do you implement it? And that's really enjoyable from an engineering perspective to see. Yeah. And uh, I mean, exactly. Like now is the time, especially looking at the markets. It's time to build, right? Yeah. You always, <laughs> Get your eyes off the charts. It's time to build. Yeah. You always build in a bear market. There's the bull market. It's time for mass acquisition of people. So the last bull market, we got the artists, we got the uh, creatives, we got uh, the musicians. They came in. Uh, this bear market, now we're talking about next generation protocols, getting the regulations cleaned up. You see like the Lummis bill, these types of things coming out. And just basically uh, cooling down a little bit and catching up, catching our breath. And right. what's really exciting is that the next bull market will probably bring the first real true upgrades to user experience and consumerizability. So right, the question right. is, how do you get from 10 million to a billion users? And that's really user where, where we're at. Problem. You know, right yeah. Now, just onboarding yep. people, it's hard. You, I mean, you lose your seed phrase and you're done. You're out a ton of money. You know, we got to make it easy for everybody. Yeah, and people get dementia. People get hit in a, by a car. And so how do you handle estate planning? You know, how do you handle custodial? Uh, under wow. what circumstances yeah. should uh, a third party be involved in your money. So the pendulum swung too far in the other direction of complete self-custody under all circumstances. And that makes sense for a lot of people, but not all people, especially grandma. Mm -hmm. And you don't want it to swing all the way back where banks are back in control. So it's kind of finding a resting place. And that's what we're trying to do as an industry in the next three years, four years. That's such a great point. Um, so in terms of NFTs, uh, I, I think, you know, to tie it into what you just said, we're kind of seeing in a way that when we kind of harken back to like pre-Coinbase days, right? People really didn't understand where and how to get crypto in a lot of cases. Coinbase was one of the the mainstream, of course, like breaking through here now. Now your mom can get it a little easier. Like Give her this app, blah, yeah. blah, blah. She feels like it's insured, everybody's happy. Um, so on the NFT side, I think we're starting to see the same thing where it's, you know, for the average person, it's very difficult and frustrating to figure out to mint an NFT to go through the whole process. And so now we're seeing that same kind of swing of like what's what's really going to help it become more mass adopted so that it is easier for everybody. So my question would be um, just in terms of NFTs, what do you think, you know, the number one utility or best use case would be that is going to drive mass adoption of NFTs? Yeah, I think you can bifurcate it in two different domains. And so one domain is where we started. And it's kind of like when the internet got around, email was the killer app and it got everybody in, but certainly the internet's just not email. It's just an example of what the technology is. So the brokering movement definition of intellectual property uh, is super powerful, super important. And what's cool about that is, you know, especially from an artistic viewpoint, it puts the artist in a direct relationship with the consumer of the art. Right. What's happened in the music business, the art business, all these other businesses, is that all these big intermediaries have come in, and they've become so powerful and predatory that they compromise yeah. the integrity of the artistic medium. 
you know, we talked to Snoop Dogg about this and all these other guys, but I did a Twitter space with him not too long ago. He's just a case study, him, Prince, and a lot of these other guys who got really beaten up when they, they first got started because they came up from nothing and they, they weren't business professionals, these things. They're just super talented yeah. people who are very charismatic, very capable, and they had uh, to kind of overcome Chicken the industry. Like yeah, and, and so- Prince literally likened it to slavery. Yeah, he did. Right and, space. So there was a reason why he was the artist formerly known as Prince, you yeah, know? Right. And, and so, uh, so th these are just examples of where it went wrong, and the point of NFTs are they're part of the, the conversation and solution about how do you rebuild an industry where you disintermediate middlemen. We started like email to the internet with banks and money, but now we're moving into intellectual property and see how it's transformative it is. The other side is a spatial web, and that's becoming huge. It's the VR, AR side of things. And, you know, back in the 90s, there was a big real estate land grab on the web for domain names. You know, so the first person owns sex.com does pretty well. <laughs> you know, that's a good domain to own. Uh, and, and why? Because there's only one of it, and it's three letters, easy to remember, right. high traffic, so high market value. Well, equivalently, when you talk about the metaverse, when you talk about digital real estate, these things are really coming, and, yeah, exactly. uh, and, and there's going to eventually be consolidation, and once there is, land in the digital space will probably be worth just as much. So the spatial coordinates, the property rights, these types of things, their uh, they're digital equivalent uh, is just the same as domain names in that respect, but just on steroids, because you can do so much more. The other side of it is the GameFi side of NFTs, so how do you right. connect games to it? We have a problem in the game world, let's say you're a World of Warcraft fan or something like that. All right, you spend 10 years on World of Warcraft, thousands of hours invested in your character, and then you get on the wrong side of Blizzard, they ban you, and then all of that's gone, gone. overnight. Because they token. own all that. Right? And it's, it's prohibited to yeah. sell your character and profit exactly. off of these digital assets, so, whereas now we're seeing play-to-earn type models. So, so, so you put those two together, and what's so cool about this is not only can you own that character, you can take your WoW character, and people can build the extended universe of WoW. Other people have never met Blizzard. You can import that character and play in their game. So you can go from one game to another game to another game with the same character and you can continue the legacy reputation and you know at some point you want to check out, you sell it, mm -hmm. somebody else can continue that journey. So uh, these are the kinds of experiments that are happening real time in the industry and it's uh, catching up a lot of steam. We didn't expect NFTs to be so big on Cardano. It's 40% of all yeah. the dApps that are being deployed I've now. I've been over spending time studying the Cardano. I mean most of the new things, it's just Cardano blockchain as far as NFTs. You know, yeah. That's why yeah. it's... Uh, you know, it's really nice. The way you said it was very elegant on, you know, Web 1 to Web 2. Last night, one of the interviews you did was with a gentleman named Adam. He said, you know, Web 1, we, we got to read. Web 2, we had the ability to write. And now with Web 3, we can authenticate. Yeah. So with this, you know, this is innovation and stepping forward. And with NFTs, you know, like you said, you can now take your character and put it into other worlds. You know, that interoperability is the future. And we're just going to have to build off of that. Yeah. Right. And what's so cool is that it's like going to be done by completely new people. You know, we build the infrastructure and the plumbing and these kids are coming in. The average age of these NFT kids is like 24, 25. So they're all right. very young and they're, they're going to do a lot over the next 10 years. They're very passionate. No, it's perfect. On, on that note, you know, the whole ecosystem that you've been building that, that's not only in support of Africa, but it's in support of all these entrepreneurs and, and innovators mm -hmm. who are building on the platform. Um, so, so Project Catalyst, tell us about that. We'd love to hear you elaborate on what that means for even the future of Cardano. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Everybody says they're decentralized, but unless the money <laughs> yeah. and the voting, the power is decentralized, you're centralized. Yep, There's yep. the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> yeah. So you have this kind of chicken the egg issue in bootstrapping a blockchain, where to bootstrap a blockchain, you need a treasury. But if your treasury is centralized, then you can never decentralize it because if people control the treasury, you probably won't give it up, and then they control basically keys to the kingdom. It's all the DAOs so, now. Yeah, so, yeah, because there are DAOs, but then maybe there's Not five really key holders or something like that that control that uh, forever. So what we wanted to do when we created Cardano was we said, well, why don't you just take some of the block rewards and you put it into a decentralized account that the blockchain itself controls, and then anybody who holds ADA can basically propose and vote on grants for people to go build some stuff. So nine rounds have already happened of this and uh, over 900 projects have been funded and you know there's thousands of people participate, 55,000 so far and that's just getting started because the user experience needs to be improved. So I think throughout next year we'll see probably a 10x in the amount of people participating and what it's allowed is everything from NFT marketplaces to wallets to foundational technology explorations of alternative roadmaps like zero knowledge proofs, all these things just to come out of nowhere. And what's so cool is it 
it uh, allows people to meet each other. Like I met a, a VR uh, metaverse uh, uh, play called Cornucopius, and I asked the guys, uh, how did you guys get started? And they said, well, uh, I was funded in Fund One, and this other guy was funded in a different fund, and they met each other through Catalyst, and then they said, hey, let's do something together. So they went and built uh, Cornucopius, just did a $10 million round nice. with it. You know, so it's just so cr incredible as an innovation management, uh, a social engine of innovation, and it's completely geographically neutral. There's people in Africa who've received funding, people in Asia, people all throughout the United States, Latin America, other places, and it's truly a, a fully democratized and decentralized experience. And it's a good experiment in how do you do decentralized governance? Because not only can this voting system be in control of, of the distribution of funds, but also could be in control of system parameters, when to fork, how to update the system. So you basically have a true democracy in that sense right. that can be uh, liquid, uh, efficient, and use many different systems. And Catalyst is just the term we use for kind of a collection of experiments in governance, treasury management, uh, voter engagement, innovation management, and so forth. And it's grown uh, exponentially since it's been launched last year. Now the long term, our view is that this will kind of form a government for Cardano, a constitution for Cardano, and then yeah. allow Cardano as an ecosystem to be truly, completely decentralized in every aspect, far more so it. than Ethereum or Bitcoin. Yeah, wow. Absolutely. Impressive, man. So one of the, one of the questions that keeps coming up uh, in some of our chats we've been having like this. We ran polls on what to ask you, because you know, you know, people, so many people are excited to talk to you, so I'm yeah, gonna yeah. hide that. You know, yeah. So this is kind of <laughs> the best of the polled ones, so we'll let you run. It's, uh, yeah, so, you know, people seeing, oh, okay, Web3, and it's the first time they're hearing this term for a lot of newcomers, and uh, even us who have been in the space, you know, it's, it's become somewhat of a new term. Uh, and then it makes you think, well, okay, what's Web 1 and Web 2? Uh, <laughs> those weren't really defined before. And so um, everyone seems to have their own way of kind of describing and defining Web 3 and mm -hmm. w subsequently 1 and 2. How would you describe it to somebody that's kind of just learning um, that <laughs> it's just like, what is all of this? You know, in the old days, we, we had the server client model and uh, yep. the original hypothesis of the internet, so this is a cypherpunk days, is everybody's their own mm -hmm. server, everybody's their own database, and basically you have servers talking to servers and uh, they, they have a rich collection of features. Now that's great when you have 700 users of the internet, they're all in a phone book and they're all computer scientists. <laughs> okay, and that's what the internet looked like in the 1970s, yeah, yeah. 1980s. It was a very small place. There's actually, if you Google, you, could, you can Google the internet email uh, phone book, and uh, it actually is a book that people used to have, and if you needed to contact somebody, you'd look them up and say, oh, yeah, this is their email roll. address. Like yeah. yeah, I know, it's like really, really small club. Uh, and then it became very clear that this whole Earth catalog, everybody's their own server notion, is not really gonna work so well. So then we started seeing this server client model uh, really come where you have a situation where somebody has a computer and the computer talks to a server and those are different people. Yeah. It's not server to server, it's computer to servers and so forth. And that's really where we were at in the 1990s. And that was a great model for, I'm surfing the web looking at websites and so forth. The problem was that it was a one-way relationship. You would go and you would receive information, but you couldn't really do much with that. You couldn't do social media, you couldn't do chats, all these types of things. So then Web2 came out, and that was really the social media revolution, yeah. and there you had JavaScript, you had all these great tools, and then suddenly it was a two-way relationship. So you're a creator as much as you are a consumer. Vast majority of content. Look at YouTube. It doesn't come from some central authority saying, hey, how, what do we do? No, it's just, millions of people coming together, creating their own content, they create channels and they become quite famous, they make a lot of money, great. Uh, it's the same for Facebook, the same for Twitter, all these type of things, it's like Jack Dorsey didn't figure out what to make Twitter good, Trump did, and you know Elon Musk <laughs> did, and all these other people, they're the hey. people who like push things out and either piss the hell out of people or got people excited, and, and so it was user driven, mm -hmm. is Web2. The problem with Web2 and Web1 is because the underlying infrastructure is controlled by large corporations, we've ended up having hyper-centralization of experience. Exactly. So a small group of actors, less than 10 major companies, yep. basically control the vast majority of your experience on the internet. Yeah. And the challenge with this is not only do they control it economically, they control the flow of information in a way that they get to decide what is legitimate and what's not legitimate. So you see terms like deplatforming, you see terms like economic deplatforming. So for example, if you're a creator and you have a YouTube channel and somebody doesn't like what you've said, then suddenly you've been demonetized. 
And it's not a hypothetical. We've seen it happen to a lot oh, of people. It's and lot. it's one of the reasons Joe Rogan actually left YouTube yep, for Spotify, for example. Mm -hmm. And so if the largest podcaster in the world with large amount of economic agency is scared about it, most people are. So Web3 is about saying, well, how do we take a step into the future where that infrastructure that we run all of these experiences on can be decentralized in some right. way? The, the storage, the network, the compute, and that infrastructure is owned by no one and it's used by everyone and it's incentivized in a very different way. Now the cool part about the Web3 model is not only does it allow the infrastructure to run in a decentralized way, but it allows you to achieve liquidity for things much faster. And it allows you to, to have many more features, like you have built-in identity. That's something the web has been missing since the beginning. We had Vint Cerf come to our conference years ago, and I asked Vint, he was one of the creators of the internet, him and Bob Kahn, uh, they created TCPIP, and I said, uh, Vint, you know, if you got a do-over with the internet, what would you do differently? Well, it took 45 minutes to answer the question. You know, so he's obviously been thinking about this for a while. But one of the things in that answer was, we didn't do identity. They didn't think about mobility and they didn't think about identity because at the time they created the internet, computers like filled a whole room. The yeah, concept yeah. of a mobile computer, they're like, what semi-truck are you putting this on the back exactly. of? Exactly. You know? And then you, think, launch, you yeah. think about identity, it's like, well, everybody knows each other. Why would we need identity? It's like, that's University of California, San Diego. This is Stanford. This oh, is yeah, it. Yeah. It's like, we're not really, we're not, you're like, we know each other. It's like, well, what happens if you have anonymous billions of devices around? It's like, that's not going to happen. Well, it <laughs> did. And because there's no identity layer of the internet, that's why you have passwords and usernames. That's why you have identity theft and all these things. So when you introduce cryptography to it, then suddenly you get identity. You remove bots. You, know, you remove the civil attack. You have voting. You have uh, much fine, more fine-tuned ways to deal with privacy and confidentiality. You have the ability to put ownership policies on things that are created. So usually what ends up happening is you create something, like a video or a picture or some content, and then you say, okay, I gotta really think about how I'm gonna monetize this and who owns this and all right. these other things. And you kind of stick some license on it. Well, at the time of creation, you can embed into the asset itself all of the terms and conditions and the economics, the ownership, these types of things. So really you remove a lot of friction and you add a lot more security. And then inevitably by adding decentralization, you add resilience and you prevent people from being, being deplatformed, which is a huge concern, yeah. not just in the United States, but Absolutely. you look at China, 1.4 billion people, they live in an economic system where if they say or do the wrong things, they get shut out of society because yeah. of social credit. Right. Uh, so it's a human concern. The other side of it is that it allows you to better control and curate the flows of information. So right now we live in this uh, weird world where information good, information bad. So it's not like, oh well, uh, there's nuances here, and let's, yeah, it's, let's, let's it's, it's just either you're platformed or deplatformed. Yeah. Uh, and you see all kinds of bizarre labels on it, and, and what happened, because dictators, totalitarian thinking, really love that lever, anything that they politically disagree with or they, they think is problematic, they just pull the lever and say it's a speech X and now it's deplatform. Web3 says, okay, we can now allow nuanced curation of things. Right. So you can attach incentives. For example, when you share something, you can share it with a bounty and say, I don't know if this is true, if anybody can verify it one way or the other, uh, you know, you get $500 or something like that. You can tip people who provide accurate information. Like during the pandemic, there was, uh, a doctor named Goodrich, um, and uh, he, he did, John Campbell, excuse me, and he did all these amazing videos day by day of just talking about what's going on. Right. Just an independent guy and yeah, everything yeah. like that. Well, if there was a tipping feature, people listening to content, they just sent him a penny. Collectively, he'd made millions of dollars and been able to uh, provide much higher quality content. So the curation of information, the verification of information, the sharing of information, the monetization of information, Web3 gives you much deeper, more granular tools that you can apply that ultimately will fundamentally transform how media works and fundamentally transform how creators do things. Now the long-term consequence of that is that actually we get rid of fake news because yeah. you can create well, marketplaces where there are <laughs> better incentives to have accurate, timely, good content versus machine-created, bot-driven, 
uh, content that really is algorithmically optimized to maximize sharing, but dead yep. sharing in yep. that respect. Couldn't agree more. You yeah. know, the, and the other side of it is we have a, a real crisis that's going to come. I think 2024 is going to be the first one. But if you look at the advancement of things like GPT-3 or these large language models in the AI space, we're really getting to a point where deep fakes are going to get so oh, incredibly yeah. good. That's getting scary. That yeah. those deep fakes are going to have meaningful influence over elections. Yep. You know, think yep. about Pizzagate in 2016. Could you imagine Pizzagate Ooh, as yeah. a scandal where there's a video of Hillary Clinton killing people? Right. And, and that looks convincing and real and people can't differentiate it. So Web3 is also about provenance, authentication, origination, these types of things. And so when you see a piece of content, instead of just automatically believing it or squinting your eyes and say, is this right? George Lucas, did he ever be on Collider? What's going on here? You'll say instead, well, there's an NFT associated with it. There's a whole digital asset trail connected to it that kind of shows all the signatures and everything. It's been verified by this group of people. That looks like real content. Yeah. Especially citizen journalism. You look at Ukraine, what's real, what's not real? Yeah. So these still. tanks blowing up, and was, it, was it stock footage from Syria, or was this well, you know, real stuff? Look at how many fake news articles, you know, the yeah. goes to Kiev, and all these things yeah. that were happening and just weren't real. Yeah, exactly. And it's so hard if you're in the media business to differentiate things with citizen journalism. So yeah. that's what Web3 is in a nutshell, concisely, is, is just this new paradigm that takes everything we've come to know and love from Web1 and 2, and it takes it to a position where you add an identity layer, a value layer, a curation layer, and then it gives you a much easier way of not only being able to participate without being shut out, but also get to the point where you can really dig deep on is this true or false, and really dig deep on new economic models that allow you to be your own boss in that respect yeah, and have yeah, economic also, agency in that respect. Much better than how I said it, so good thing we had him do it. <laughs> so actually, I'm glad you mentioned Jack Dorsey. Um, because I've only seen the headlines, uh, I have not looked into this at all, so thus I will ask the question. He's coming out with all <laughs> Web 5. What, is, what, what, happened, <laughs> what happened to Web 4? What's happening? What is this? I don't know if you've even had a chance to look at what it is. Happened this morning. Yeah, you know, it's uh, like uh, I'm a big fan of Spaceballs, and they had Melbourne yes. come out. Yes. Spaceballs too. The search for more money. <laughs> Spaceballs, <laughs> the flamethrower. Um, no, that's funny. <laughs> I don't know what the hell Web Five is, and if he's building on Bitcoin, I think he's uh, digging too deep into his ayahuasca. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, Bitcoin's a useless platform for these types of things. I mean, it's a great yeah. store of value. It's a great place as an integrity ledger, so you can use it to, to put things and it's, it, you know, it's immutable, it's timestamped, it's irreversible. So if you want to store something with op return, uh, like a hash or something like that, or if you want to you know, use it as a value transfer mechanism for large amounts of value, uh, sure. Uh, but if you were talking about like what we were just talking about, rich programmability, information right. curation, these things, you're literally talking about millions to billions of transactions, even for mid-sized applications on a daily basis. You're talking about billions of user-issued assets. You're talking about a lot of rich state that needs to be transferred around. There are no protocols on market, Cardano included, that are natively capable of doing things at this scale. It's going to take another three to five years and miracles of technology. A lot of layer two action with payment state channels, a lot of things with recursive snarks, a lot of advancement in authenticated data structures. There's huge consensus improvements that need to be made. This is a very complicated problem to yeah, create decentralized yeah. infrastructure at scale. Something we've been thinking about as an industry for well over 10 years, and you'll notice something. There is no decentralized Infura or Alchemy or these things at the moment. It doesn't exist. So it's easy to go and make grand proclamations and say Web 5 or Web 69, as Elon Musk <laughs> tweeted, which was funny. Uh, you can say that stuff, but at the end of the day, if it's meaningful and have real impact, you have to be very specific about what are you trying to achieve. Like, for example, if you want to build a decentralized Twitter, whether the, the, the information is on a server or not is immaterial to the real problem that you want to solve. Mm -hmm. The real problem you want to solve is that your information curation is good. So when I tweet something, there's a process where people who receive that can understand whether what I'm saying is reasonable or not. And yeah. that's not decided by Bob in the closet as a uh, censor, you know, the truth yeah. police. It, no, it's, it's done through a, a decentralized process. That's what Twitter is really valuable for. I see a tweet, how do I know it's right? How do I interact individually with that information, collectively with that information, right. if I care about it, to verify it? 
And then also, how do we add to the story? How do you build onto the story? How do you have memory inside the system where you can look at the history, like a particular person, are they credible or not? It'd be really nice if I had rich tools to be able to look through the entire tweet history and sentiment analysis and other things, so I can know, well, they tend to lean in this particular direction, and they tend to say these outsized grand claims, but their credibility and track record has historically been wrong, versus they tend to lead in this direction and they've been very precise about their language and so forth. This is a deeply credible actor and that's a uh, network-derived reputation metric. That's really what you need to solve. And then, of course, the platforming, you achieve that by making a protocol that's decentralized so, and then you build interfaces on it. So Twitter is the entry and exit point it's like the wallet, almost in a certain respect, but anybody can build their entry and exit point. And the underlying infrastructure is a federation of things, for example. You could do that, and people are exploring this type of technology, like Filecoin and mm -hmm. these other things. Yeah. And there's been historic attempts like Steam and so forth, and they've been somewhat successful. But I, and then the other side of it is you have to get the ad model right. So if you look at Bat, for example, with Brave, uh, if, if you guys run a Brendan Nick, I, th I th saw him just earlier today, you know, he created JavaScript, now he has his own web browser. Well, how did they get 40 million users? They created an incentive layer with the BAT token. and basically creates a two-way relationship with advertising. So when you want to monetize user data, you get cut into that and you have a lot more control and granularity yeah. over what is shared right. and how your privacy is preserved. So you need a good ad model, you need a good infrastructure game and a good information curation game. And notice that's just for decentralized Twitter not for decentralized everything. Yeah, the needs yeah. of a video sharing service are distinctly different, different than a social yeah. network than all these other things. So it's very complicated and so forth. And I wish Jack would talk to us. You know, he follows me on Twitter. Or I've reached out to him a few times. And there's just some people in the Valley that seem to talk very loud about our industry, like Musk and Dorsey right. and others. And they don't seem to want to engage with the people actually building things. And you know, we can have a great two-way relationship, a conversation about, well, what protocols would you need and what are those time horizons and what foundational problems you want to solve and so forth. Do you think there's a reason why they're doing that? Is there a reason why they're staying apart? Do you think it's money related, which is usually the stem of all evil? Or is there another type of... Maybe do you think they're doing something on their own in the shadows? <laughs> they could be. I mean, they're Never billionaires know, right? and they have a lot of power and right. you can do these things. I, I mean, I was at Eric Schmidt's birthday party and I was talking to one of the people in the circle and they're like, we're building five layer ones. Okay. Cool. I mean, you're Eric Schmidt. <laughs> you, can, you can do that, right? You, know, you yeah. can reach into Google and all your other contacts and get a thousand engineers to go do something. Um, with Jack in particular, I think he's pretty strong on Team Orange. I don't think he's Max yeah. Kaiser Team Orange, but uh, he's certainly... <laughs> Team Orange, and maybe the love of Team Orange is so overwhelming that it, it makes him believe that the altcoin space is not viable or doesn't mm -hmm. exist. And that's just sad. Yeah. Uh, with Musk, he's all over the damn place, and it's uh, strange some of the things that he says and does. And, you know, he's very uh, much in love with Doge. And I, I made a yeah. video kind of tongue in cheek saying, well, if you want to rebuild Doge and make it useful, you know, here are 10 papers to read that are, you know, really good ideas that would... Why scrap two by fours to a broken building yeah, I, and you can build a new building, new foundation well, and build right. it right? Well, if the building has a gargantuan network effect, like, you know, if you have a skyscraper and you already have a thousand tenants rented out, maybe you want to retrofit it as opposed to building something new and convincing them to move over. I don't know, you know, it's, uh, it's his decision to make. Maybe he's going to buy Twitter, maybe he's not, you know. He's a strange guy, and yet the market seems to love him. I mean, if you contrast yeah, Bill Gates yeah. to uh, Elon Musk, you know, Bill Gates, he's like, oh, let's go save Africa. And I was like, get away from me, you monster. <laughs> and then you go to Elon Musk, and he's like, we're literally going to drill a hole in your skull and install wires into your brain so you can communicate with a computer with your head. And they're like, Sign yeah, that's, Black Mirror yeah that's really cool. Yeah. Sign me up. And, and, then it, and then he's like, oh, by the way, don't. Don't don't worry about the event horizon monkeys. You know, so <laughs> I guess they I guess they had this issue like the monkeys they put the things in went crazy event horizon style and started killing each other themselves. What are, what are we getting like, ourselves into? Yeah, like this stuff happens, and <laughs> yeah. and everyone's like, ah, I see Elon Musk, he's okay. It, it's it's almost like when I started Ethereum with Vitalik and the rest of the gang, we went to Switzerland and we were negotiating with the Swiss government for our tax right. ruling. And so we were sitting in the Canton Zug and we, we had this lawyer, he was at MME Partners, he was the most brilliant tax lawyer in the world. His name was Sammy. And he would go and explain to like the Canton of Zug how the taxes were gonna work. And he's like, yeah, they're gonna raise like uh, $25 million and you know, not pay taxes. And, and I was like, what? And he's like, <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, we'll sign the tax ruling. And, and we had this joke that like Sammy could get away with anything. We'd be at like an airport and have a gun on him or something, go through the metal detector. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, there's a gun. You can't board a plane like that. 
<laughs> okay, get on the plane, Sammy. It's okay, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, so Elon is like the Sammy Buseman of 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 technology. So he just gets yeah. away with whatever the hell he wants. He's probably gonna buy Twitter for half the price with all oh, this yeah. negotiation. It's, it's definitely looking like it's, it's crazy. So I don't know why these OGs do what they do, but they have superpowers I don't have. Yeah. I wish I had those superpowers. I do. I have to say, I I, I like the fact that the overwhelming amount of bots on Twitter is effectively being exposed. Yes. Because yes. that's a huge problem. Because part of that is being used to shift public consciousness to inflate engagement for certain things. And, you know, uh, wow, always a wealth of knowledge, man. Um, that I'd, I'd just love to hear, I, I think the last thing, just what are you most excited about for the future of crypto in general? When you wake up in the morning, what like really keeps you going? Well, what's really cool is we're starting to have a diverse conversation. You, you, you go to a conference like this, and you go to a lot of technology conferences, and there's a look. You know, it's, it's, it's white men at a certain age group, and they're doing something. And, and then you go to a crypto conference, and it's like so diverse. You have people from all over the world, not just uh, in terms of ethnicity and language and gender and culture, but also in profession. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was walking around, we saw professional basketball players, right, uh, yeah. you know, you saw boxers, you see musicians, you see people who are, who are farmers, who we're talking about Massey Ferguson tractors here, wow. these types of things, <laughs> in addition to hardcore technologists and bankers and regulators and so forth. So that in many ways, this industry is really starting to bring a very diverse, very unique crowd of it people really together. Is. And it's never been that case in any industry in history. You're right. So the magic of that is because you have so much diversity, the diversity makes you stronger, more resilient, and more brilliant. So what gets me most excited is to see the product, services, ideas, and the rollout that that cauldron, that mixing pot, is going to create. That's what made America great. If you think about this nation, it wasn't uh, that we were smarter than everybody else or somehow we built this amazing military. That was downstream of the immigrant culture of America. Exactly. We were the mixing pot of the world. People came from everywhere to be here. And when they came from everywhere, they brought what made them unique to America. And then that became part of the cultural milieu. So that's why there's no country like the United States. And similarly, uh, crypto is a, micro, is a macrocosm of that, where it, it's bringing the whole world together and we get to see a, a lot of magic. And I think when that's applied to new industries, because everybody's so diverse, they're going to take care of their interests. So they're gonna make thing, sure things are fair. They're gonna make sure things are equitable. They're gonna make sure that everybody has equal access to the solution as opposed to one actor. And also people have enough principles to know that maybe you shouldn't centralize power. That's another really exciting thing. It's like every time a new industry yeah. comes, you go from one king to another king. Right. You know, yeah. so we went from banks to technology companies as a driver of growth, but they still have kings. Yeah. And now we're going to a situation where we're getting rid of those middlemen, we're disintermediating exactly. people, and every single industry, whether you be in media, or you be a content creator, or you be a technologist, or in medicine, you can get to a point where those things e evaporate. And actually see that in practice and train people. It's almost like uh, Plato's uh, cave, the allegory of the cave, where everybody's being let out and they're saying, holy shit, those shadows aren't the real thing. This is the mm, real thing. Yeah. You can't go back into the cave. You can't be like, yeah, no, let's re-centralize everything. Right. No, because you get how dangerous it can be when things exactly. are centralized. And the only reason it's sold to you is it's necessity. You, that's the only guy. It's the only person you can trust. Well, if you have a third option, it's like, no, I, I can trust something else, and it's much better. So that's what gets me most excited, is the diversity and the it. application of that diversity towards solving problems in a truly global way, and getting us to a point where I think the world is, is going to be able to be optimistic again. I'm tired of right. the cynicism. I'm tired of the pessimism. Yeah. I want to just live in a place where I believe tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Hoskinson, that was, that was incredible, man. Thank you so much Thank for your you time. So much. Cheers. I couldn't agree more with everything you said. And uh, yeah, this was a pleasure. Thank you for your time, man. A lot of fun. Thanks, man. Yep. Cheers. Cheers.